and welcome to livealittlehigher.com. This week we read Parashat Toldot. It's the parasha in which Rivka and Itzhak have their two twin sons. As we know the story, one is a good guy, Yaakov. From him, the Jewish people will emerge, the 12 tribes of Israel. And then we have Esav, who is the firstborn, who is... Um, we could call him a heretic. He went off the derrick. He left the fold, and um, and um, sadly, he never immersed himself in his legacy. So today, we're gonna learn a lesson from Esav. We can learn from everybody, as the Baal Shem Tov says. Everything you see and everything you hear really is a lesson in the service of Hashem. And uh, there's many lessons that we can derive from people that are not living a rightful life. There's many things we can learn from them. And from the Sihas of the Lubavitcher Rebbe, there's a very interesting one in which he speaks about Esav and his relationship with his father and what it meant. So we see that last week's parasha, parasha Hayesara, concludes with the genealogy of Ishmael. Ishmael's family. And as we know, Ishmael is the son that Abraham has with his concubine Hagar because Sarah could not give him children. And it came to a point where she gave, her, gave him his, her, her handmaid. And he had this son, Ishmael, who was uh, 13 years older than Itzhak, eh, than Itzhak that was ha- Sarah's and Abraham's son. So we see that the parasha ends with his genealogy. And these are the offspring of Isaac, And the Midrash infers from the conjunction and that the offspring of Isaac mentions here are thematically linked to the offspring of Ishmael mentioned earlier. Who was this? What, what, how can they be linked? How can they be compared? And so we learn from Shemot Rabbah, who was this? It was Asaph and his children, who just like Ishmael, were sinful people. So we see that both Abraham and Isaac, the two of the greatest men of, of our faith, our forefathers, had good and bad children. It's not nothing new under the sun. We there's a family, you have many kids and then you're having kids that are are good children, they're children that follow the, the dictates of Hashem, they go in Hashem's ways, they're kind, they're merciful, they're generous. And sometimes in a family you can encounter one kid that really is completely the opposite. And so if we see that this can come from such great people, it can happen to anybody. But what the, the, the Siha is talking about is what we can learn from Esaf and from his descendants. So we see that Isaac's life story unfolds. It becomes clear that his relationship with Esau is very different from Abraham's relationship with Ishmael. Uh, the unique character of Isaac and Esau's relationship is central theme of Isaac's life. He, he, he really took over his life. Uh, Ishmael, on the other hand, Abraham, sent him away from his life. He, he sent him for many years away. He was not part of his life. So therefore, Yitzhak's offspring, in the metaphorical sense of his life work, is Asaf. And for it is in Asaf that we see Yitzhak's primary contribution to the development of the Jewish people. So what does this have to do with us? Uh, we know that Asaf represents the Western world, the Western values, and the Jewish people represent something completely different. And um, it's been a war ever since between the internal Esav and the internal Yaakov. We have both of them inside of us. We have a part of us that wants to be godly, wants to be connected to Hashem, wants to do the right thing. And then we have a part of us that wants instant gratification, wants pleasure from the world, wants um, to have a good life, a fun life. And, uh, and it's, we all have them, we have them within. So the fundamental difference between Abraham and Isaac's divine service was that Abraham influenced the world. So we're gonna see how Abraham's outlook on life influenced Ishmael and 
Isaac's outlook, outlook in life influenced Asaph. So we see that Abraham was all hesed, was all kindness. He was going from place to place, traveling the whole world, teaching people about the divine, uh, the divine consciousness, teaching them about God, about a monotheistic religion, only believing in one God, uh, and trying to get people not to idol worship. And he was very much out there, and, uh, and, and it worked. It helped a lot of people to reconnect to the one God and, um, and to be more holy. And so, but Isaac, on the other hand, was the complete opposite of his father. He was Gevura, he was a contriction, he was a discipline, he put boundaries. He never left the land of Israel because he had been an offering to God. He could never leave the land of Israel. He didn't travel a lot in the land of Israel. He was very much in his own place. And, um, and we see that his work was a very different type of work. He was not out there inspiring people. He was not this Chabad Lubavitch rabbi bringing people to, to have meals and, 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 and a shiur. And this was not the type of Itzak. His, his work was to, to inspire people to dig within themselves. He, this is the whole allusion that he went to dig the wells. What does it mean to dig wells? is that inside of the ground, there's many treasures. There's a lot of treasures to be found. And in the same way, his life work was to teach people to look within, to, to not so much up there, it's what's inside of you. And so, so he, he Itzak, his work was to inspire people who came to him to dig deep within themselves and uncover divine water. So they, he wasn't out there looking for people. People came to him when people wanted to learn. And Abraham's inspiration was top down, while Yitzhak's inspiration was bottom up. So there's, these are two approaches of connecting to Hashem. Uh, in Kabbalah, they're known as the feminine waters and the masculine waters. Uh, one concept, the masculine waters are that come uh, from up to down, and the feminine waters are that they elicit the water to come down. So, as we know, uh, everything you do here has an effect up there. Uh, your life, really, everything that comes to you, you create it in this world. So, there's a concept in, in, in Kabbalah that, yes, Hashem sometimes sends us an inspiration, He sends a miracle, an open miracle, Sometimes he sends something that wakes you up, that moves you. And, um, and that is incredible because that really moves people to change. But in reality, if they don't move and they don't start digging within themselves, the, the, the effect is not gonna last a long time. I remember many years ago, a friend of mine went to Israel with her family. And uh, she's a very traditional person, but she never really got the opportunity to really learn Torah and to practice a Torah lifestyle. And when she came to Israel, it happened to be Ashgaha Pratis that they had hired a religious uh, tour guide. And this man took them all over Israel and he gave them uh, Israel's historical religious perspective. Every story of King David, every stone they, they stepped on had a story and connected to the Torah, and this really moved her. And I remember when she came back, she was really upset that how could it be that she was in her 40s, she had never seen this, she had never learned about this, and she was upset. And so I said to her, look, Hashem has just given you uh, a gift, and this is from the high down, this is what the approach of Abraham. He has just sent you a gift, he has sent you an aha moment of inspiration, and it's up to you if you're gonna take it and you're gonna work on it, or it's just gonna be that. And in a few weeks, it's gonna wane down, it's gonna go away and nothing happened. So she says, so what do I have to do? I said, well, let's learn Torah. And we started learning every week. We would do lunch and learn, her and me, and then suddenly more people started coming and it became a thing. And she eventually, uh, made some changes in her life, but it really came from her, from her wanting 
to connect from her wanting to learn more to dig inside of herself in order to be able to connect more to Hashem so this is the, the approaches that the Rebbe is explaining to us that there's this approach which is advantages when you have an aha moment in your life and, and, and something sparks and something lights up within you and, and it's incredible and this was the approach of Abraham he would influence people he would inspire people with his food and his the way he treated guests and all these things he did all his kindness many people got very inspired but if people didn't end up working on their self they would they, it went away and the bottom-up approach which is the Itzak's approach is not such an easy approach uh, it's more about transforming our natural tendencies about really elevating ourselves and, um, and by, by hard work, by get, becoming people that eat in a certain way, dress in a certain way, we pray, we give tzedakah, like there's a discipline, there's a, there's a, there's a seder, there's an order and, and in your day. You wake up and you have an order to be able to, to grow and to, and to deep, deep search within yourself and you're in, in, in unrefined part of yourself to be able to refine them and elevate them. And so conserve, conversely, the top-down approach illuminates a person, even if he's in his lowest state, it will touch a person that is very, very far away. And that's incredible because Hashem has kindness within him and he's always trying to reach out even to the most, uh, to the person that is the least interested in connecting to Hashem. He's always trying to get to them. But at the end of the day, it has to come from us. So we see the effects of these different approaches in the relationship between Abraham and Ishmael and between Isaac and Esau. Ishmael uh, departed from Abraham, leaving his father's holy environment for a life of hedonistic and selfish pursuits. But he later repented, he did teshuva, he came back. And, um, and eventually when uh, Abraham passed away, he went back to his old ways. So we see that this uh, Abraham illuminating the world, if you're close to him, you're fine. But once the, the, the tzaddik left, he was left again with all his urges. So it means that he never worked on himself. He never tried to, to, to conquer his evil nature. He just kept being Ishmael. At the end of the day, nothing changed. Uh, and he, he was not considered a Jewish boy. And, uh, and also from this, we know he didn't inherit from Abraham, he gave them gifts, but the inheritance went to Isaac. Esau, on the other hand, departed from a life of holiness. He le lived in a place that was the holiest of the holiest with Isaac. Imagine he was, a, he was a, an offering to God. You can't be closer to, to holiness than that. And, uh, but he nevertheless, he didn't want that life. He, he renegated, he didn't want it. it. He had all the potential to be even greater than Yaakov. He came, his neshama came from a higher source, but nevertheless, he didn't want to be, um, live a Jewish life. He didn't want to live a holy life. He only wanted to be part of the mundane, of the material world. He wanted to eat and he wanted to drink and he wanted to have fun and he wanted many wives. And he even was a murderer just for fun. That's all, he, he killed people for fun. So we see from here that, uh, that Esau, Esau, nevertheless, even he, if he was the ho most horrendous son, he was considered a Jew and he inherited from, from Isaac when he passed away. So furthermore, Esau was also buried with uh, Isaac when uh, Yaakov passed away and they came to bury him in the cover of Hamachpelah, in the, in the, in the uh, Machpelah, in the Hebron. Esau came and one of the grandsons of Yaakov got upset that he was there and he cut his head, he was beheaded. And the, the Midrash says that his head rolled into the, into the kever 
and it ended up in Isaac's bosom, and the head of Esav is buried with his father. So the head really is the intellect, is the intellectual capacity, is the sehel of a person, the intelligence of a person, and, and this part is buried there because uh, his head, he was a Jew. His body, he acted like worse than an animal, but his head was still a Jew. So this paradox that Ishmael displayed more spiritual sensitivity, sensitivity than Asaph, yet his connection to Abraham was severe, while Asaph retained his connection to Isaac. This can be understood based on the above explanation of the different approaches of the patriarchs. That even though uh, Asaph turned away from his father's ways, nevertheless, he was a Jew. And Abraham illuminated even the darkest places. He was able to tap into even the, he would have gotten to him. So Ishmael was naturally inclined towards negative behavior. This was moved by the force of his father's persuasion to repent. So because his father was always influencing him and inspiring him and he was able to, for a while, repent. However, this illumination doesn't last uh, a long time and change doesn't occur. That's what I said at the beginning of the, of the, of the shear, that yeah, you have an aha moment in your life, but if you don't work on yourself, it's not gonna stay with you, it's gonna disappear. And that's what happened to Ishmael once his father died, that was it for him. There was nothing else that would maintain him in that state. Yitzhak did not illuminate. He was not this luminary that came out into the world and light up the world. Uh, he was a different type of person. He was a more introverted, insightful type of person. And he excavated the goodness from the darkest places. That's why he always was digging the wells, because he knew that to really transform, to really be able to connect to Hashem in a truthful, holy way, it has to come from within. And he knew that every person had the spark, that every person had the ability to really transform themselves. And that's why he never, never gave up on Asaph. He really, truly believed that he could turn around. Sadly, this was not the ending of the story. This is not what happened. But he, he believed that it was possible if the person would only want to do it. And so he had a profound effect on Asaph, despite Asaph's natural sinfulness, because his, sin, his nature was not his fault. He came wired to be like that. He came to be that. But in his head, if he would have used his intellect to, to work on his emotions and his desires, he would have been able to turn around. The problem was that he didn't want it. So this effect, though, was limited to Asaph's head, which is susceptible to illumination. The body of Asaph, emblematic of his lowest derives, remained detached and remo removed from Isaac. But because of Isaac's persistence and during excavation, Asaph was al always remained as a Jew, and therefore inherently alongside with his twin Yaakov. This also, this is also the reason why Isaac insisting on blessing Asaph specifically. Like we would have thought, like he decided, he knew this guy was trouble. How, why would he want to give him the Olam Abba, the world to come to a person like this? But in reality, Isaac could see beneath the, the surface. He could dig inside of Asaph. He knew the truth of Asaph. He knew that Asaph had the capacity, had the, the, the ability, he had everything in his favor to be able to turn around and be the best of the best. Sadly, this was not what happened. And Isaac believed that with his blessing, he would be able to elicit a complete transformation of Asaph. That's why he wanted to bless him because he really truly believed that if he blessed him, he would have turned around. Uh, Rivka, on the other hand, sighed very differently. She didn't see that that was a possibility, and she saw that Yaakov was the person that was truly meant to inherit the Olam Abba and the Olam Ase. And so, Ele, so this is what happened. Uh, Yitzhak wanted to dig a well deep into Asaph and bring his living waters to the surface. That was what he really desired. Uh, we see that the lesson here is the Rebbe teaches 
that Isaac was connected to Asaph and searched for his essential goodness despite all evidence to the contrary. And this is a, a lesson for us in our days. We see people that seem very evil, that they are, they, they, their ways are horrible. But nevertheless, within themselves, there's deep, deep inside of themselves, there's buried goodness. There's, they're, they're, uh, they come from Hashem. They're a creation of God. So how could we believe that something that comes from God is completely evil? Everybody within themselves has the power to transform evil to good. We all have it. Everybody has it. But the only thing is that we have to desire it. We, want, we need to ha want to be good. And if a person doesn't want to be good, nothing can change them. So this was before the giving of the Torah, when all the Jews were chosen and designated as God's children. However, much more so today, we must, be, we must, after the giving of the Torah, never give up in searching of the goodness of others. We should be like Isaac. We should always be digging, digging, digging deep into the living wells of every person and try to bring out the best in them. I remember a story I heard uh, a few days ago of a woman that had a child that was very rebellious and she was very uh, upset with this son. She, she didn't even like him anymore. Like she really did, lost her love for this son, if we could say it, because he was, he was a troublemaker. And so she went to a, a psychologist and she's telling her about her son that she feels so guilty that she, she doesn't love, it's hard for her to love this son. He's so much trouble in everything. And so the, the psychologist said to this lady, you know what, when you go home tonight, just try to look for one good thing this guy does. Look for something that he does really well. And once you find something that he does really well, start complimenting him. And so she was there. The other kids are such good kids. And this kid is a havoc in the house. It's a nightmare. And she's like, okay, it's time to go to bed. Please go wash your teeth. And the first one that runs to wash his teeth is this boy. And she didn't realize that this boy always ran to wash his teeth. The other ones are like, no, no, I don't like it. No, I don't like this toothpaste. And this kid would run and wash his teeth. He says, oh, there's one thing he does well, one thing. And she realized there's something good that he does. And so she started complimenting him. And she was like, oh, I'm so proud of you. You're the first one to wash your teeth. You're the first one to do it. You know what? I'm going to give you a present. And after this, other good things started coming out from this boy. So... This is the approach of Isaac. It's the approach to dig the well, to always try to search for that kernel of light within other people and to try to extract it and make them see it so they can build up in the good. And, um, and this is what we learned from Asaph. And, and if anybody of you are struggling with people around you, this is the approach. This is the approach to go. So I wish you a blessed week. Uh, Rosh Chodesh Tov, this week we begin the, 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 the month of Kislev, the month of light, of transformation, the month of Hanukkah, of joy and light. And, um, and remember, live a little higher. Thank you. Thank you.